When it comes to system add-ons and clumsy hardware blunders, few devices are quite as infamous as that of the 32X. Sega's crazy attempt at extending the lifespan of their Genesis platform into the life cycle of the console generation of the main 32-bit platforms. After presenting a recent deep dive showcasing the history of various pieces of Sega hardware, their games and my experiences with them, people have been daring me to upload a video highlighting to you all why you need to gain one of these bad boys for your collection. As amusing as I find this idea, in all honesty I couldn't do this while keeping a straight face, and the upload would have ended up being nothing more than satirical. So. Rather than try and convince you why you need this mushroom shaped delight in your lives, I have decided to go in a little less hard and instead see if at the very least I can get you lot to forgive this frightening failure for its shortcomings and maybe even give it an ounce of long needed respect. So within this video, join me as we take a trip back to the mid-90s as we not only analyse this magnificent misstep in history, but look at this platform's unique games and my personal hands-on experience with the hardware. So with all of this said, hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here. This is the story of the Sega 32X, a platform that deserves your forgiveness. Yeah. When it comes to now retro systems, particularly those from big companies of the time, such as Nintendo and Sega, I can usually recall first-hand experience of playing a platform during its active life cycle and seeing the advertising. As for the 32X on the other hand, I literally have zero memory of its existence from my youth, which tells you all you need to know about its UK marketing presence. Online records suggest it launched in my home nation around Christmas of 1994, but I guess I was too distracted by the wonders of what was Donkey Kong Country that festive period to care for such an oddity. Like many others out there, I became fascinated with the 32X after seeing it on the Angry Video Game Nerd, laughing at the mess of cabling that was required to just enjoy the Genesis while using its two add-ons. From that moment on, I knew I wanted one, an objective I would eventually achieve, but not until about 7 or 8 years ago. I finally tasted the forbidden fruit that is the 32X during my busiest stint as a professional wrestler, buying my unit from wrestling colleagues. In the amusing twist of his tale, I purchased my 32X from the UK Pitbulls, friends of mine who are Europe's heaviest tag team. Again, this is kind of surreal in itself as before I knew them personally, I saw them on Dirty Sanchez as a youngster. You know, the Welsh jackass, where they would force Pancho to lick Bulk's sweaty gooch. I am not sure what is stranger really, the fact that I actually own a 32X or the fact that one of the previous owners had their gooch licked on national television. You let me know what you think is weirder in the comments section. So that's the strange tale of how I procured this strange device, but why did it exist in the first place? Well, although Sega's legacy within the video game industry is an impressive one, and they will historically always be one of the most remembered and recognisable companies within that sphere, it is rather unfortunate that in more recent years, they are perhaps almost as well known for their trademark balmy decision making as they are for their consoles, games or blue hedgehogs. The mid to late 90s in particular saw the Japanese gaming giants make several curious and puzzling missteps, but some of Sega's most confusing, odd, counterproductive and downright balmy decisions were directly related to one of their most ill-fated, ill-conceived and ill-advised products to date. This unfortunate little add-on was in many ways doomed to fail before it was even launched, and ended up being one of Sega's most costly mistakes. The early years of gaming and the first several generations of home consoles could probably be quite accurately summed up by one simple single syllable word, bits. Despite the fact that nobody had the foggiest idea just what these little so-called bits were, how they functioned or how they actually benefited the games and systems they were powering. Several years of very persuasive and cleverly worded marketing and advertising had convinced people they were the absolute be all and end all of a console's capabilities people might not have quite comprehended just what those little bits were or what they did, but what they knew for sure was more is better. 
Amber unwashed masses were practically salivating at their collective mouths, desperately looking for as many of those sacred bits as they could get their greedy little hands on. Thinking about it, it all seems a bit silly now in retrospect, but the gaming industry, and more specifically the gaming media, had pre-programmed the marketplace into thinking that the progression of the number of bits was the only progression that truly mattered, and they had whipped the public into a frenzy during the early 90s over the imminent upgrade from 16 to 32 bit technology. Sega's massive success with their all-conquering fourth-generation powerhouse, the Mega Drive, meant they were well-positioned within the industry to continue making hardware and retain their position amongst the top brands in gaming, but the pressure was on to stay ahead of the curve and remain at the cutting edge. That pressure increased further when those sneaky dogs over at Atari jumped the proverbial line and brought out a supposed 64-bit console in 1993 in the form of the Jaguar or so they claimed at least. Regardless, or however you semantically describe the capabilities of the JAG, it still left the Mega Drive in the dust, in terms of both graphical prowess and those all-important bits. And the release of a CD-based 32-bit powerhouse, the 3DO, put yet more pressure on the already overworked staff over at Sega to slave away even harder on keeping up with the competition. Like the bickering siblings that they so often are, typically it seems that Sega of America and Sega of Japan had very different ideas about how exactly they would make the next step in bit technology, with the Japanese branch of a company eager for a cartridge-based 32-bit machine to be developed. While Sega of America were keen to do everything they could to keep the still relatively popular Genesis alive and relevant. In January of 1994, Sega president Heio Nakayama propositioned several Sega of America higher-ups with the concept of developing such a system, with the idea being that it would serve as a something of a sequel to the Mega Drive. Vague plans for this proposed, entirely new, independent console flew around for a while, with it initially being tentatively referred to as Genesis 2. After much deliberation and back and forth, the proposal that this new system would be an add-on was agreed to, and Sega of America were tasked with development, while Sega of Japan would provide any extra research or assistance needed. The new piece of hardware was renamed Project Mars, and the poor little Sega elves had to have it finished, tested, packed and shipped, ready for 1994's Christmas season, which was less than a year away. Whilst all this was going on, unbeknownst to Sega America, their sneaky rivals at Sega of Japan were busy developing a 32-bit system of their own, using optical discs and advanced 32-bit processors. This bit of kit would go on to become the Sega Saturn, and it was the console that Sega were planning on pumping all of their resources into, which begs the question, why was Sega's American branch even continuing with such a thankless task? when their Japanese supposed colleagues were in the process of designing something that would render their new system immediately redundant. I really don't know, but continue their thankless task they did. And the eventual design of Project Mars featured two Super H2 processors, which were developed by Hitachi in tandem with Sega during a venture in 1993, and could provide 32,768 colours which was a vast, vast improvement over the Mega Drive's 512. It was also capable of enhanced scaling and rotation, came with two digital sound channels, and most importantly, had support for polygon-based 3D graphics. Project Mars was eventually renamed Sega Genesis Super 32X, and then finally shortened to just the 32X, before being unveiled in prototype form at the Summer Consumer Electronics Show of 1994 in Chicago. The system went over pretty well, and judging by some of the shady footage they showed of games in development, it's not hard to see why. Looking at some of this footage now, compared to the finished games we actually got on 32X, it's pretty laughable and crazy to think that they got away with claiming that we were looking at future gameplay footage. Ah, the innocent and naive 90s, a time when gaming advertisers could literally get away with anything. Sega also managed to hook people in with an extremely tantalising looking list of developers, all signed on to make titles for the new system, featuring a veritable who's who of development giants, including Acclaim, Activision, Konami and even Capcom. 
Prior to launch, things were looking pretty good and surprisingly promising for the little add-on that few had any real faith in. This feeling of optimism was soon replaced by one that Sega of America would unfortunately have to get used to over the coming years, and that was the impending feeling of doom and gloom. Things started going very wrong for the not even released yet 32X, when Sega of Japan announced that their upcoming Saturn console would be released natively in November of 1994, literally the exact same time that Sega of America had scheduled the release of their add-on. I mean honestly, it just feels like they're doing it on purpose now. This was a huge blow to Sega of America, who were absolutely apoplectic about the news and how it would affect the company, their well-established brand loyalty and their future as hardware developers going forward. Although the 32X was being marketed as a quick fix before the next proper big boy consoles arrived, the fact that the Saturn was coming out in Japan at the exact same time made the Genesis add-on seem like not much more than a short-sighted cash grab. Producer Scott Bayliss was quoted as saying, it just made us look greedy and dumb to consumers. You really can't help but feel that Sega America got done dirty here. 3DO head honcho Trip Hawkins referred to the 32X as a band-aid in reference to its relationship to its parent console and the system was fast becoming a bit of an industry inside joke. The Sega Genesis 32X was finally released in North America on November 21, 1994 with a launch price of $159.99 amid a typically over-the-top bombastic 90s Sega-style advertising campaign that cost the company somewhere in the region of $10 million and managed to be a little raunchier and more risque than the previous Genesis and Sega CD ones using slightly more adult themes. Presumably, this was because the young teen demographic they so aggressively targeted in the early 90s would now be a few years older and thus more receptive to such things. Although the marketing was fairly successful, the actual system on launch was met with almost immediate negativity, with one of the main complaints being the overly complicated setup required to even play the ugly little thing. Not only did the 32X sit awkwardly on top of the Genesis, looking like some kind of cheap robot mushroom, it also required its own connector cable, AV cable and dedicated power source. What's more, rather than just shove the device straight into the top of your console, it was advised you should use these weird little metal prong thingies and a spacer to ensure proper connectivity and to keep the 32X sturdy inside the Genesis. Although to be fair, the system works absolutely fine without using either of those things. The dedicated power source issue was extremely problematic. If you had a Sega CD as well, you'd need an empty socket for your TV, a socket for your Genesis, a socket for your Sega CD and a socket for your 32X. These aren't little diddy plugs either. These are those huge brick things that could cause serious injury if you should ever drop one on your foot. That doesn't exactly leave much room for anything else now, does it? The other major issue with the system's launch was the games on offer, or rather, lack thereof. Despite Sega promising an extensive choice of games to choose from, only four were available on release, and one of them was the universally panned Cosmic Carnage, a game so bad Sega were actually ashamed of it and didn't even want to ship out. The other three were the excellent Virtual Racing Deluxe, which was by far the strongest launch title, Star Wars Arcade, which proved to be the most popular game for the 32X, and the closest thing it had to a system seller, and well, Doom, which as we know is on everything. Despite all of the issues and missteps, Sega's miracle working marketing campaign had done it again and managed to give the 32X a pretty successful launch, with the system selling 500,000 units by Christmas of 1994, far exceeding their initial sales projection. The add-on was released the following month as the Super 32X in Japan and the Mega Drive 32X over here in PAL regions. And although the Saturn was already available in Japan, giving consumers little reason to pay the 32X any attention, there was initial high demand in Europe, particularly here in the UK, giving the system another successful and dare I say promising launch. Like I said earlier, I must have been too distracted by Donkey Kong Country fever to even care. 
It might have looked for a brief moment in time like the ugly mushroom that no one wanted to play with might actually defy the odds and succeed, but that fleeting moment was soon gone, and the bubble began to burst on the 32X when the next wave of games for the system started coming out. Hurried, forced release date timelines and development confusion with the overly complicated new hardware led to several very rushed games being released that were in no way making full use of the 32-bit system's new capabilities and did not look close to matching the improvements in graphical prowess that had been promised or that people were expecting. Despite the fact that Sega had teased a new 3D Sonic game at the recent Consumer and Electronics show, it also seemed strange that there was no new Sonic game on the horizon or being talked about at all. Truth be told, things were already looking bleak for the system just a few weeks in, and sales dropped dramatically and rather depressingly immediately following the holiday season, with faith seeming to have been universally lost in the frivolous little add-on. Many devs that had been planning on releasing games for the platform either abandoned the titles completely or transitioned to turning them into Saturn games. Things weren't looking good for the future of the 32X and Sega had little choice but to drop the retail cost of the system to $99.99 by early 1995. This dropped again to $79.99 soon after, and by later in the year, you could pick one up from various stores and discount aisles for as little as $99.99, which to put it in context was a third of the cost of one of the 32X's games on launch. It truly was one of the most sudden falls from grace of any mainstream gaming system, and by October of 1995, less than 11 months after it was released, all future plans for the console were cancelled, and the plug was pulled on the 32X. I wonder if that's the same plug that powered the system and annoyed everyone so much. By the end of the 32X's lifespan, a rather paltry 40 games were released for the device, with some of them requiring both the Mega CD and the Mega Drive to play. This was a bit of a last gasp effort by Sega to try and drum up a bit of last minute interest in the dying system by combining the tech of both of Sega's Mega Drive add-ons. Unsurprisingly, particularly given the games on offer, it failed miserably. In a similar attempt to try and bleed every last drop of cash money they could out of the utterly redundant 32X technology, there was also plans underway to release a combined Mega Drive 32X console in one standalone unit called the Neptune, but the device was abandoned completely when Sega brought the American launch of the Saturn forward. Shame really as although it would only serve as an unnecessary curiosity, the sleek prototype designs look rather sexy and I would like to own one. The story of Sega's final Mega Drive add-on ended up being a bit of a sad one. The 32X was never set up to succeed, quite the opposite in fact. It seems that Sega of Japan were almost opposed to the project to begin with, and their balmy decision making ended up doing unfathomable amounts of damage to Sega's branding in America, as well as their standing as a respected company globally. The 32X was a bit of a mess, with a laughable design and a thoroughly inconvenient amount of wires and cables. Looking back, it's no wonder the system was a complete failure. But it's still a bit of a shame, it was never even really given a fair chance. Which is one of the reasons it deserves your forgiveness, despite all of what I've said. But if not being given a long enough chance to flourish isn't enough of a reason for you to give it a chance today, then how about the games it has on offer? Let's begin discussing some of them. Let's start by talking about one of the launch titles for this device, Star Wars Arcade. In my opinion, this is a visually impressive game for 1994, and it controls well. A further nice touch is that classic music is here and arranged nicely from the original Star Wars trilogy, which adds a lot of atmosphere to the game's levels. The game consists of you flying an X-Wing, intercepting TIE fighters in an asteroid field, destroying a Super Star Destroyer, and making an assault run on the Death Star. The game is short and sweet, and it's overall a very simplistic arcade experience. I suppose this gives the game an excellent pick up and play nature now. Next up we have Space Harrier, a 1985 arcade game which has been freaking ported to everything. I first had my first experience with this game within the arcade in Shenmue and was quite frankly mesmerised. I later got to live my Space Harrier retro arcade experience out in real life too when I got to play it on an actual cabinet at Funspot in New Hampshire. By this point in time, Space Harrier had been ported to over 20 systems, often with varying results in terms of quality. 
The 32X version of this game is a fantastic one, giving a very authentic arcade feel, which is a lot better than the earlier release of Space Harrier 2, which can be found on the standard Sega Mega Drive. On the subject of great arcade ports, we also have Afterburner on the platform, a near arcade perfect conversion I must add. This combat flight simulator by Yu Suzuki of Shenmue fame allows the player to control an F-14 Tomcat jet, which you can control to destroy a series of enemy jets throughout 18 stages. Again, just like Space Harrier, this game is fantastic fun and a welcome addition to anyone's collection of Sega 32X games. Next up, we have Mortal Kombat 2. Well, the game is a uh, Mortal Kombat 2, but how good was this version? Well, side by side, it looks better than the Mega Drive version of a game, but not impressive enough of an update for this to provide a great reason to play this particular conversion. The 32X also has WrestleMania, the arcade game, which is fantastic fun. The game actually plays more like a fighter than a wrestling game and graphically looks quite similar to Mortal Kombat. This game is absolutely insane and makes no effort to take itself seriously. The game features ridiculous animations such as Yokozuna dropping turkey legs all over the ring and a bloody Undertaker doing ghost Hadoukens. It's available on other hardware too but stands out more in the 32X's smaller library. BS Racers is a Mario Kart clone that is a spin-off of the Chuck Rock series of games, so I suppose this game gets to rip off both Mario Kart and the Flintstones simultaneously. Very nice. From my experience with this game, it is nothing special, but at the same time, there isn't that much wrong with it either. It reminds me of Street Racer, another Super Mario Kart clone I remember having back in the day. One of the most iconic games for the 32X is Metalhead. Metalhead is a highly impressive looking game for the period, and is a 3D first person shooter mech simulation developed and published by Sega. The game features full textures and mapped polygons. The levels in this game are broken down into missions, though most missions are to destroy all the enemies in that area using the mechs and various projectile weapons. The game is an impressive example of what the first 2X was capable of. It's just a shame there aren't more titles made for it like this. Speaking of impressive looking games, aesthetically, one of my favourite looking on the system is Calibre. The game is an odd little shooter where you control a hummingbird, which offers numerous power-ups for the player. Each power-up in the game follows different patterns, including spread shots and homing in on enemies. The game also features several puzzles which grow increasingly difficult with each level. It's a nice addition to the 32X library. Virtual Fighter is one of the earliest examples of a game within the fighting game genre made from polygons. In fact, I think it might be the first game I can recall that uses polygon model characters that I can think of full stop. Virtual Fighter for the 32X came out on the system several months after it had already seen a release on the Sega Saturn, so overall it is far from the best version of the game, but its existence is historically noteworthy, and this is still Virtual Fighter. Another game that was ported to everything, which has a half-decent 32X version, is Doom. Due to the game's extra power, it looks much better than the Super Nintendo version, and much better than the abysmal effort featured on the 3DO. It's just a shame that the music got downgraded compared to other ports of this classic PC game, but it does serve as more proof that there are plenty of decent 32X games. A rather striking looking 2D platformer is Tempo. Aesthetically, this is a wonderful looking game with a great art direction. Sadly, the game doesn't play quite as good as it looks, but at least it is a handsome one. Another base is a Japanese space shooter and the only game in the Zaxxon series to feature 3D polygons. I got a fair amount of enjoyment from this strange looking isometric game, which is undoubtedly one of the more unique looking titles within the 32X's library. The game was quite harshly criticised at around the time of release, however I think this one is not too bad, so give it a try if you like. Finally on this list I have left what I believe to be the best till last. Previously I have heard a lot of bad things about Knuckles Chaotix, however upon experiencing the game myself, I discovered most of these claims to be untrue. Knuckles Chaotix is the lost gem within the classic Sonic series. Even utter tripe like Sonic 3D and Sonic Spinball receive regular re-releases, but there is no love for Knuckles. The game introduces the tethering platforming mechanics and features a non-linear order of stages. I like this one, it's a little slower than Sonic, giving us a little more time to think. This is a thinking man's game and reminds me a lot more of Rystar on the Mega Drive in terms of gameplay. 
It's sad really that unlike most 2D Sonic games, this one doesn't get re-released in compilations every generation. So the fact that this game is on the 32X is one of the strongest reasons as to why you should perhaps forgive the hardware and try it out. As you can see from all of this, the 32X library is actually fairly decent, with plenty of hardware examples being out there that offer up far less interesting exclusives. There may actually even be more interesting exclusives available on the 32X than there is on the Xbox One. All in all, the 32X certainly has plenty of weaknesses and was far from an ideal product for most consumers to invest in. But that doesn't mean there aren't some silver linings to this overall grey cloud, which is why it so desperately deserves your forgiveness. It's a quirky system with a fun little selection of games. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, subscribe and watch my recent one on the Sega CD. Cheerio.